In this episode on Earth's magnetic flip, we'll pull back from seeking out official information and connecting the dots, and we're going to focus instead on some key questions that come up over and over again. First one is about timelines. When is this going to happen? Well, that's a very tough question. It's happening now. Do you mean when we have the flip? When will things get bad? When will things go back to normal after things get bad? Many ways to read that question, but the simplest way I can think of to answer it is with some modeling. It can be done even with limited data. As we come to look at a chart of Earth's magnetic field strength, presuming a baseline of the 1800s, which had persisted more or less a long time before that, we know that in the year 2000 we had lost 10% of Earth's magnetic field, shown here as 90 for 90% compared to the 1800s, and then the 15% loss number updated in 2010, shown as an 85 here, for 85%. What comes next are the best case, worst case, and middle of the road, based on that limited information that a slowly changing magnetic field kicked into a weakening phase that saw 10% of the field lost since the 1800s, and then another 5% in just the next 10 years. The blue line shows what happens with no further speeding up of the process. The yellow line shows a continued acceleration over shorter and shorter periods. Red line is merely the middle of the road between them. While this graph is indeed helpful for figuring out how little of our magnetic field will be in play over time, it indeed does not tell us when things will get bad. That's likely a personal definition for each of you anyway, and there's no real way to tell if that's 20%, 50%, 70%. We do know that the field tends to retain at least 5-10% to of its strength during reversals. What we can say is the fact that these lines confirm Berkeley and the previous work by the USGS and Occidental indicating that these events can happen rapidly within a human lifetime. I doubt that question about when things will get bad is one that anyone could answer, nor exactly to what extent cosmic rays will intensify at the Earth system. However, we could put our heads around something similar, and include the fact that our sun's motion relative to the local dust cloud has us exiting it over the next couple of decades to centuries and going into an empty pocket. This indeed is the third shield against cosmic rays that Earth is losing right now. This chart will require some explaining. The blue area shows the total universal radiation. And indeed, being inside the Milky Way only provides a minute bit of protection given that for every bit of the sky, shielded by other stars, there is an object much closer that could produce energetic radiation. The blue area begins to recede strongly within the local cloud. The dust may be relatively sparse as we would consider it, but it is vast and it blocks out radiation the further in you go. The solar magnetic fields of the heliosphere around our solar system take out much, much more, and so do Earth's magnetic fields. But as we come out of the local cloud, we are watching one shield against this radiation disappear. The pink area is the luxury we have enjoyed inside the cloud. As we exit, it'll be disappearing in favor of the blue. And then as the sun enters grand solar minimum, we are already seeing the highest cosmic rays of the space age and we do expect it to go much higher. The dark yellow is the reduced radiation that again we have enjoyed as a luxury during solar grand maximum the last few decades. And lastly, we've got Earth's magnetic field weakening as well. Now at this point, we do see the lines begin to converge as nothing really stops the highest energy of all particles. But alas, the green yellow and pink have been our luxury and we are indeed headed for much higher rates in the future. Now lastly folks, there has been nobody willing to yet take on Yale's cold climate bomb, but something making the rounds online is that the two Princeton scientists who wrote the study redefining the future of climate models under a vastly cooler cloud forcing paradigm were just two scientists. There's even a prominent climatologist who said that nobody else at Princeton would stand by that paper. Not only would the paper not have come out if that were true, but here is about a minute and a half of a longer video by Prager Yu interviewing a professor emeritus at Princeton who wasn't one of the paper authors and who may have to disagree with that one climatologist. Enjoy. I'm a physicist. I taught at Columbia University and then at Princeton for five decades. I've published over 200 peer-reviewed scientific papers. I have co-authored several books, including one of the first on how carbon dioxide emissions, CO2, affects the climate. I served as the director of the Office of Energy Research at the U.S. Department of Energy. And before that, I invented the sodium guide star, which is still used on most big astronomical telescopes. In short, 
I know a lot about the Earth's atmosphere and climate. I also know a lot about long-term predictive climate models. And I know they don't work. That's why over the last 30 years, one climate prediction after another, based on computer models, has been wrong. They're wrong because even the most powerful computers can't solve all the equations needed to accurately describe climate. Instead of admitting this, some climate scientists replace the highly complex equations that describe the real world climate with highly simplified ones, their computer models. Discarding the unmanageable details, modelers tune their simplified equations with lots of adjustable inputs, numbers that can be changed to produce whatever result the modelers want. So if they want to show that the Earth's temperature at the end of the century will be two degrees centigrade higher than it is now, they put in the numbers that produce that result. That's not science. That's science fiction.